This episode of the Otaku Experience, the anime not a new show. We talk about the current goings on in the anime and manga industry with our very uneducated opinions. I am once again your host, Israel King. Now, before we get into the big news this week of everything going on with the Boy in the Heron Studio Ghibli, uh, Hayao Miyazaki not retiring, we'll get into all of that in a second. First, I want to give an update to the Uncle Roger and Toei Animation story that we covered on last week's episode of the Otaku Experience. So, if you don't remember. Last week, we talked about a story where Uncle Roger uploaded a video where he's he, it's a series that he does where he reacts to different people cooking Asian cuisine. And in this case, it was an episode of One Piece. Um, and I believe they were cooking curry or something like that. And uh, he was watching it, giving his criticism. It was about a 12 and a half minute video and he was using the footage from the episode. Um, Toei Animation, who is known to be very... Uh, aggressive with their copyright strikes and everything, especially when it comes to their crown jewel, which would be One Piece, copyright strike his video, um, which is a big deal because he has eight, uh, over 8 million subscribers on YouTube. So you'd think that those people, uh, you know, would be able to, I guess, have connections in YouTube to like double check like, hey, is this going to be striked or is it not going to? But either way, he ended up getting striked. Uh, we talked about that last week. And um, uh, like within an hour of right before the episode aired. So that means it was already filmed. It was already edited and it was already being uploaded to uh, the Burnett Network YouTube channel. Uh, there was an update that came out where Uncle Roger said that they had actually taken away the uh, strike. And so now the video will stay up on the channel, uh, which is a good news. Good news story. Uh, happy to hear that. Um, I still recommend everybody go to watch that video, even though it's not going to disappear now. I still recommend that everybody goes to watch it because I still think that it is a really fun and entertaining video. I really like un Uncle Roger. And uh, yeah, okay, so I wanted to get that out of the way because that happened like right when it happened. And I was looking at the live chat for the premiere of when the episode was airing. And they were like, hey, Israel, actually, uh, the strike is gone. And I was like, but this is already... Uh, anyways, but um, so that being said, we're going to hop right in to the main stories of this week, starting with our big, big story, The Boy and the Heron. So this has been our big story for like the past month and a half at this point. Uh, the Boy and the Heron, the latest film from Studio Ghibli, the latest film from Hayao Miyazaki, and what we believe to be the last film from Hayao Miyazaki up until some news that came out last week, which we'll talk about in a bit, finally has released its trailer before it went to the Toronto International Film Festival. So we got the trailer last week. I loved this trailer. I I watched we uh so I was with my girlfriend and I was with my parents. We were about to watch um the next episode of Ahsoka, episode four. Um, and I I saw that uh the the trailer was uploaded. And so I was like, guys, 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 and I put it on. And I don't know if they cared as much as me, but I sat there with like the biggest, dumbest smile on my face. I had so much joy. I freaking love Studio Ghibli films. I love Hayao Miyazaki's work. And it was just so freaking fantastic. Um, I, 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 like, I don't know how to express how magical of an experience it was, but this is one of the reasons why I was so upset when they said that they were not going to market the film. I was like, because I know that it's going to be good stuff. Um, and so that that just really boggled my mind when they decided not to do that. It was really, really strange. But I have the trailer right here. And uh, so we have some of these amazing shots, freaking amazing shots. Like, look at this tracking shot right here. Um, so, okay, first, all right, hold on, look at this, look at that, look at the depth of field in this shot, you got, like, a blur on, like, the edges of the shot, so, like, if, if I were the shot, like, here would be, like, all blurry, and then the focus, like, shifts back, it's really fantastic stuff here, um, and it, it's, I'm definitely seeing this in IMAX, because it's getting an IMAX release, and it's going to be freaking fantastic, so we get this tracking shot of, this boy, I, I assume this is our main character, running through these people and like they're all blurry and it's like completely focused. It's so fast and smooth. And this might be a dream sequence or something because of the way everything's kind of going on there, um, which I think is really, really fascinating. Uh, going a little further into the trailer, um, we get to see some of what I assume is going to be the majority or at least a good chunk of the film, which is more of like the typical stuff where it's very 
Ghibli art style. We know this. I guess that's the Heron. Uh, new film from Hayao Miyazaki. Um, we have these old people that are like in every Ghibli film for some reason. <laughs> uh, and then, of course, the Academy Award winning director of Spirited Away, House Movie Castle, Princess Mononoke. Um, and then uh, we get we get like these amazing. I, like I, I just keep saying amazing, but it, it is. Um, I can't play the music because uh, I don't want to get copyright struck. So, but it's. It, it, it's it's just it's amazing it's it, it's so good the music the way it swells the the voice acting is perfect the art style being ghibli um it's it i i don't know i was like i was like trying not to cry when i saw it and i was like bro thank you for doing this ghibli we've been waiting um and so it was it was just a freaking fantastic trailer. I cannot wait for this movie. Um, and I, I can't wait to hear what people are thinking about the movie. And not to spoil something that we're going to be talking about here in a bit, but we actually do have thoughts from people who have seen the movie, which we'll talk about here in a second. Another thing we have for The Boy and the Heron, uh, other than the trailer, is we have a, a box office update for The Boy and the Heron. Um, so The Boy and the Heron has now earned over 7.7 billion yen, which if we translate that to um, US dollars, that's going to be uh, 52 million. Uh, and this is coming to us from Anime News Network. Now, if I pull open uh, Box Office Mojo, which I usually like to do to compare it to things. Um, so I believe this is its eighth weekend, I believe. I, 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 am, I, am I wrong in that? Let me double check here. Um, so we have the boy and the heron. Okay. So the boy and the heron. Here we go. So if I open its Japanese release, okay, so this is week eight. By the end of week eight, it's made about $53 million in US dollars. If we did uh, the first slam dunk, uh, that is going to, if we go to its Japanese release, that in its eighth week, because I've been liking, I, I've really enjoyed comparing it to the first slam dunk in Suzume um, in terms of its box office. And so its eighth weekend is actually not here, but it's going to be between 72 and 64. So let's just peg it at like a solid um, 68. Yeah, because that's this is a eight number difference between which put it at four in between. Okay, so 68 roughly. Let's let's just put it there. So that puts uh, the boy in the heron at um that puts it what is that it was at 53 did i say yeah 53 versus 68 okay so that means it's still about 50 uh, uh um yeah 15 million behind it and then let's compare it to suzume which i i like to see as well compare the ghibli miyazaki film to um a film that kind of became this really big juggernaut and then which would be the first slam dunk and then also compare it to Suzume which is you know coming off the heels of your name and weathering with you like Shinkai is just going crazy right now and so uh, Suzume in its eighth weekend was at 83.7 so now we're looking at a three million dollar gap uh, closer to the beginning of the run if you guys don't remember or if you're new here closer to the beginning of the runs um uh, the Boy and the Heron actually was doing better than Suzume and the first Slam Dunk. And then over time, Suzume kind of, like if this was the fir uh, uh, the Boy and the Heron and this was Suzume, it kind of starts like this and then Suzume does this. And then with the Boy and the Heron, it kind of, or uh, the first Slam Dunk, it kind of does this and then slowly the first Slam Dunk takes it. So they're both overtaking um, uh, the Boy and the Heron, but... Uh, one faster than the other. So I would like, I, I'm curious to see how this next weekend is going to play out with all the stuff going on at uh, the Toronto International Film Festival, which we'll be talking about here in a second, as well as the trailer, now that they've had a true marketing push on this. Um, and so I'm excited to see if that's going to bring out any more people in the Japanese audience, if we're going to see not just a really low decrease in its box office to box office week, but actually a maybe an increase, you know, maybe like a 10%, 20% increase in its next week box office compared to this previous week. Because if we look at this here, um, 
we have uh, a minus 32% drop. We have a minus 31.1% drop. We have a plus 11.7% drop. So I don't know what was special about this week here, um, but for some reason it went up. Then it went down again to 31.2% drop, 29.9% drop, minus 24% drop. I'm going to predict that it's going to be sub 20 sub minus 20. So I, I think it'll be, if, if it drops at all, it'll be below a 20% drop. And I'm actually going to wager that it might increase. It, it maybe even just a little bit, maybe like a 10% increase like it did back in August uh, 12th through the 13th. Um, and so I, I think that's really interesting. Um, here what's going on with the boy and the heron. And I, I, I still think that they should have marketed it. I think that this would have been doing so much better. I think it could have been on par with Suzume or at least very close, maybe even surpassing it if they had a true marketing campaign because this is Ghibli. At the time, we did believe that it was uh, Hayao Miyazaki's final film as well as just a, a Miyazaki film, which we, you know, we get those, you know, so not like super rare, but it takes like, you know, five years to get a new Miyazaki film um, minimum. And so it, it's been a while for all of those aspects. And so I think that this should have done so much better, especially in its Japanese uh, box office run. Um, and so it, it it's not doing bad. I can't say it's doing bad, but it, I, I think it does leave a lot to be desired here. Um, and so that's kind of my take on that. But that being said, going back to this anime uh, news network article, they say... Um, there you go. Uh, the film sold 1 million tickets and earned about $13.2 million in its first three days in Japan. Uh, we saw this. Okay, here we go. Uh, Hayao Miyazaki's latest film, The Boy and the Heron, um, uh, has sold 5.17 million tickets and earned about 7.7 .7 billion yen, um, about 52.6 million as of Monday. It is now the 88th highest grossing film in Japan and the second highest grossing anime film in Japan. Just for reference, uh, the first slam dunk last week, I believe, just finished out at number seven of... Uh, all-time anime, I think. I think it was. Um, I could be wrong there. The first slam dunk. I just want to make sure I'm not mistaken, but I know it's in I know it's in the top 10 yet. So so it surpassed Ponyo as the number seven all-time anime film in Japan. Uh, whereas um The Boy and the Heron right now is at number 22, and the first slam dunk also is the 13th highest earning film of all time in Japan, whereas The Boy and the Heron, I believe they said was 88th. And so The Boy and the Heron still has a little bit of room to make up. Um, I don't know if it can catch up to where the first slam dunk got to unless uh, with all the marketing that they're doing for the international markets that it can catch up, uh, that, that more Japanese viewers start going because they see all of that. Um, but that's that's really interesting. Uh, we'll definitely keep an eye on this uh, as we talk about it on the Thursday show. Um, and that'll be really interesting to see. But getting into the big stuff, okay? The Toronto International Film Festival had happened, or at least it started, and the first film to debut, as we talked about before, was The Boy in the Hair. Now, this is a big deal for a couple of reasons. One is that um, this is the first animation, not just anime, but animation film to uh, kick off the festival, as well as the first Japanese film to kick off the festival. So a lot of firsts here for The Boy and the Heron. Now, according to this uh, Deadline article, it looks like Guillermo del Toro appeared at uh, appeared at the festival uh, to celebrate the film, you know, being released. And he talked about some Hayao Miyazaki stuff. And so if we can go through here, you want to get out of my face, Deadline ads. OK, The Boy in the Heron premiered at the Toronto International Film Festival with a surprise guest who did not hold back his admiration for Hayao Miyazaki. Deadline reports that the that the uh, surprise appearance by Guillermo del Toro uh, was met with an ovation at the Toronto International Film Festival. The crowd might have not anticipated he was one who would walk on stage when TIFF CEO Cameron Bailey introduced him as Miyazaki's most passionate fan. The Academy Award-winning director was eager to introduce The Boy and the Heron, but not without first having his say on Miyazaki, who skipped the event to build the film's mystery. He knows uh, what makes my fat butt move. Del Toro joked to a pleasantly surprised crowd. He then excitedly emphasized to everyone that they were first to experience the film outside of Japan. Uh, the Boy and the Heron deliberately went under the radar and was released with minimal marketing effort. The film's international debut was also particularly special, as it was the first time a Japanese title or a Japanese film jump-started the Toronto Film Festival. Uh, he echoed the anticipation, saying that this movie's world... Uh, 
GD premiere to a cheering crowd. He, he also took the opportunity to speak at length uh, about Miyazaki's artistic legacy. Then he compares Miyazaki to Mozart here. We are privileged, uh, privileged enough to be living in a time where Mozart is composing symphonies, Del Toro confessed. Miyazaki-san is a master of that stature, and we are lucky to be here. There's an overwhelming critical acclaim for all of Miyazaki's projects. But any Ghibli fan will agree that Miyazaki's works approach sublime art um, and mythology. Guillermo confirmed as much, saying Miyazaki has changed the medium that he started in, revolutionized it, proved it over and over again. That is a tremendous work of art. And then the final paragraph here, they say... The director also drew parallels between his artistry and Miyazaki, exploring the paradoxes that are essential because Miyazaki understands that beauty cannot exist without horror and delicacy cannot exist without brutality. He repeats motifs over and over again, flying, hope, despair, the power of innocence, the great of innocence. Each of his parables, because they become parables, are full of belief in humanity and full of heartache in humanity. I believe the film we will watch tonight will be no exception. He shared uh, the sentiment of many fans who will be delighted to learn that the, contrary to previous reports, the Boy in the Heron is not Miyazaki's last film with Studio Ghibli. Whoa! Samsung deadline ads. Ridiculous. Gosh, right? They knew I was like on the last sentence. They were like, bam, got him. Jump scare. Ah. Anyways, uh, so yeah. And, and we'll be talking about the fact that this is no longer going to be Miyazaki's final film um, here in a second. But it did premiere at the Toronto International Film Festival. And now we have official reviews for the movie. And so we're going to head on over to Rotten Tomatoes here uh, because they actually have reviews here for the movie. So right now it's rocking a, well, hold on, hold on, hold on. Right now it's rocking a 100% with the all critics. And if we head over to the top critics, still 100%. So there have been no negative reviews. It has an average 8.4 out of 10 with the normal critics. And it, out of the top critics, it has an 8.7 out of 10 average. So this is boating super, super well. I hope it keeps that 100. That'd be fantastic. But odds are it's probably going to be in the mid to high 90s, maybe even the low 90s, but still going to be a fantastic score. Obviously, this is an amazing movie by all accounts. So getting into some of the reviews here, we're not going to read all of them, but some of them. Uh, we have Sindent Adlaka, uh, who says, gazes into the past through an imaginative and wondrous lens. Whether or not it's truly Miyazaki's final work, which we now know it's not, it's the fine, it's the fondest possible farewell. Um, so, okay, so he's saying that, assuming that this was going to be Miyazaki's final film, this was a good goodbye and, and a great career ender. Obviously, it's not going to be, but I guess these people didn't know that at the time. Uh, Prabjot Baines, I'm sorry if I mispronounced that. The Boy and the Heron is a mature, solemn, and jubilant meditation on loss and legacy, one that deems death to be a transitionary act, uh, a new beginning, and in that way, nothing really starts or ends. Ruben Barron says, um, even if it's not Miyazaki's swan song, this movie sure knows that birds are cool. <laughs> Chris Bumbre says, um, a lovely and bittersweet reflection from an old master, Brian Tuck, uh, Talarico, The Boy and the Heron is another wonderful piece of work from Miyazaki. It's a gift. Mark Ash, uh, The Boy and the Heron is originally self-synthesizing and achingly sentimental, uh, collating artistic motifs from across the Miyazaki filmography and nakedly articulating the hopes it places in the next generation. Daniel Howitt, uh, film, uh, final film or not, it's clear that Miyazaki's reflecting on what he wants to say to his loved ones towards the end of his life. This is uh, one of his most personal art artful films that will likely grow in richness as time passes. Can we pause real quick? I'm just getting so freaking hyped up, bro. I'm so excited for this. Like, why wasn't I invited to TIFF? You know what I mean? <laughs> they're like, no, no, he's been poo-pooing on Ghibli because they're not marketing the movie. Well, don't make a bad mistake. I won't poo-poo on you. Okay, anyways. <laughs> but, dude, I'm reading some of these, and I'm like, dude. Dude. Like, like, because I've seen Miyazaki's films, and I love them. Uh, my favorite of his is, uh, currently is Howl's Moving Castle. And if what these people are saying is true, like, if I feel the way these people are saying, this might be one of my favorite films ever. Ver, 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 ever, which would be fantastic. Richard Lawson says, uh, there is so much to savor in The Boy and the Heron. It's visual splendor and it's winsome insistence on life's indelible meaning, stitched and seamed by daily choice and boggling chance. David Fear, no one needed further proof that he is a master. This meditation on grief and growing up does solidify the position. However, that Miyazaki remains the greatest living animator today. Period. Um, and I, I guess let's do one more. Let's do the last one here. Let's go to the very, very bottom. Emma Steen. Miyazaki's latest 
uh, film stands as a testament to his enduring legacy. It's a mature, complex masterpiece weaving together the director's past, present, and future, a beautiful enigma that promises to be worth the wait. You know, because one thing that, that I'm really thinking about as I'm reading all this is no one's really acknowledging or bringing up the fact that this is going to be like outside of Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. This is your best animated feature front runner, and it could even possibly be nominated for best picture, which is insane because... Spider-Verse is already being in that conversation of this is going to get nominated for Best Picture. Could you imagine, and I'm not saying this is going to happen, but hypothetically speaking, could you imagine if this was the first time in cinematic history where not one, but two animated films get nominated for Best Picture? I don't need to say any more than that. That is, I'm getting chills. I'm going to cry, bro. That's fantastic. I can, ah, um, yeah, that would, that would just be so amazing because I'm, I'm, I'm reading and listening to all these people, you know, these people who are in the know, who were like, yeah, we're, we're, we're going to guess what are going to be your big contenders for the big major Oscar categories, you know, at this point in the year, you know, the strikes causing a lot of movies to be delayed. So they're kind of changing how their rankings are going. And something I haven't seen on most of them is The Boy and the Heron. I'm like, why is this not like your front runner for best animated feature? Like, they're like, oh yeah, Spider-Verse will probably get nominated for best picture. Um, for best animated feature, you know, you got, uh, 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 what, what, what came out this year? You know, you got Elemental, you got, uh, uh, uh I don't, I don't remember what came out this year. And I'm like, no, it's none of those. It's The Boy and the Heron. It's Spider-Verse and The Boy and the Heron. Okay, Spider-Verse basically already is going to be nominated for Best Picture. We all know this, which means that it's probably going to get the Best Animated um, Feature Oscar. I would hope, I, and I, I still hope that they would acknowledge that Spider... And I, I haven't seen this, so I'm, for as much as I know, I'm talking out of my butt cheek right now. But I, I would like to think that if Spider-Verse gets the nomination for Best Picture and becomes the fourth animated film in history to do that, along with Beauty and the Beast, Up, and Toy Story 3, that, I think, would be enough for them to be like, okay, that's that's your achievement. You got that. You're one of the four films, four animated films in history to do that. Best animated feature, the Oscar, we're going to give to The Boy and the Heron. Because uh, from what I know, and I, I need to go and research a bit more into this, but from what I know, it seems like in the other major markets in the world outside of America, it sounds like each country can really only back one film or, or basically back one film heavily for Oscar consideration. Because, you know, the Academy doesn't have time to watch an entire, like, so many others, and I'm not saying that's a good or a bad thing, I'm just saying that's a thing that happens, you know, it's impossible for them to watch, you know, every movie that come out in every country in a year. So each film, or each country really has to back like only one or two movies to be like this, this is the nominees. Um, and then the Academy can choose to nominate those or not. Make no mistake, this is Japan's nominee this year. No question about it. I believe last year it was Drive My Car. This year, it's The Boy and the Heron. No question about it. No doubt in my mind, this is the one they're pushing. The way they're doing the Toronto International Film Festival, the way they've been trying to do the marketing campaign, which is actually a lack of a marketing campaign, um, the way they've been handling the trailer, the way that he didn't even show up to Toronto International Film Festival because he wanted to keep it a mystery, whatever that means. They are trying to build up this buzz. Guillermo del Toro came out talking about it, and we know he's been a big part of the Oscars throughout the years. This is the one that they are pushing for heavily. And so as much as I love Spider-Verse, it's still my favorite film of the year. I haven't seen The Boy in the Heron, so I don't know how this will fare with it. And I haven't seen, uh, the year's obviously not over, it's only September. Um, so there's more movies that are going to come out this year. And I think there's movies that I still uh, haven't seen um, earlier this year that I just maybe missed in theaters and I, I need to get back to and, and, and finish. So there's still room for a bunch of things to shake up and change. But this, what I don't really know what I'm saying anymore, but all this to say, this could be your best animated feature. And I, I would, I would hope that they don't just like, you know, 
Uh, Spider-Verse, we're going to nominate for Best Picture. And because of that, by default, it's going to win Best Animated Feature. I, I don't really like that. Because that happens with the international film category all the time where they're like, okay, yeah, so this film was made outside of the U.S., so we're going to nominate it in uh, Best International Feature, and then we're going to nominate one of the ten or one of the five international features into uh, Best Picture. And then it's like, oh, gee, I wonder who's going to win international feature. You know what I mean? Like, so if we spice it up, maybe, and be like, hey, not every time that someone is nominated for Best Picture and another category... Are they going to uh, win that? You know what I would do? Honestly, you want to know what I would do? I would, if a movie is going to be nominated for Best Picture and it's in one of those other categories, whether it's an animated feature category or international category or documentary or whatever, if it's going to be nominated for Best Picture, don't nominate it in the other category. So what I mean by that is if Spider-Verse is going to be nominated for Best Picture, don't nominate it for Best Animated Feature. The reason why is because we know that is a dead giveaway that it is going to win because it is nominated for Best Picture. And so to keep that race still exciting and to give it to another film that deserves it, because while Spider-Verse may not actually win the Oscar for Best Picture, um, that I, I, I still think that just because it got nominated would be reward enough for that team. And I, I, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe they really want both the Oscars, which, I, heck, I probably would too. But to keep it exciting and to share the love as much as possible, if you nominate Spider-Verse for Best Picture, and they're not going to do this, they don't care what I have to say, but if you nominate Spider-Verse for Best Picture, nom don't nominate it for Animated Feature, nominate The Boy and the Heron, give The Boy and the Heron the Oscar for Best Animated Feature, Spider-Verse gets nominated for Best Picture, and that's what that gets. That's all I have to say. But that being said, uh, those reviews really bode, bode well for me. I'm so freaking excited for this. But that being said, we're going to move into this, the big story, the title story of this episode. Miyazaki's now retiring. Okay, so listen to this. Okay, this comes to us from CBR. Okay, uh, Studio Ghibli executives claims that uh, The Boy and the Heron will not be Hayao Miyazaki's last film, which first of all, Then what the freak is this marketing campaign been about? I thought the whole thing was like, yeah, we're going to make it a mystery campaign. So that way it's, you know, really cool for his final film. How long has he known? Sorry, I'm just, I'm getting, I'm getting mad about the marketing again. Sorry, 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 sorry. Anyways, let's get back to the article. Uh, Studio Ghibli Vice President uh, Junichi Nishioka claimed that the boy in the heron, uh, acclaims director Hayao Miyazaki, um, was already working on his next project already, like how long ago already. Um, entertainment reporter Eli Glasner uploaded a, a, a post to X, formerly known as Twitter, wherein he reportedly discussed Miyazaki's plans for the foreseeable future with Nishioka during the Boy and the Heron's red carpet uh, premiere at the Toronto International Film Festival. Um, exciting news for fans of Hayao Miyazaki. The post reads, Studio Ghibli VP Junichi Nishioka tells us The Boy in the Heron is not Miyazaki's final film and that he's already coming into the office with new ideas. And here's that post. Exciting news for fans of Hayao Miyazaki, Studio Ghibli VP Junichi uh, Nishioka tells us The Boy in the Heron is not uh, Miyazaki's final film and that he's already coming to the office with new ideas, hashtag TIFF23. Nishioka did not reveal details regarding Miyazaki's next project or, or what role the acclaimed filmmaker would take during its production. The news might not come as a surprise for longtime followers of Miyazaki who already returned from retirement several times in the past. This is true. Um, I, you know, it might sound like I'm I'm like changing history or whatever, revising his history, but I, I don't think I've made like a full statement. I've just kind of said what they've been saying, that they believed that it was his final film. So I've been saying that it's his final film because that's what everyone's been saying. But yeah, it's one of those things where like in Transformers, Michael Bay after, you know, Revenge of the Fallen was like, I'm done. And then they were like, come back and do Dark of the Moon. So he came back and did Darth, Dark of the Moon. And he was like, I'm done. Then they were like, come back and do Age of Extinction. So he did Age of Extinction. Then he was like, I'm done. Then he did The Last Night. You know, it's one of those things where he's like, okay, I'm done with filmmaking. Okay, but maybe one more. Okay, retirement. Okay, but maybe one more. Okay, one more. Okay, you know, uh, and so he's an artist. Artists don't, as an artist myself, as as someone who, who views himself as a storyteller who wants to make movies for a living, not want to, I need to. It's like a pathological need of mine. You you get consumed with whether it be one or a couple, but you get consumed with 
for for in, in my scenario in in my case usually it's one you get consumed with this one story that you have to tell and it you can't think about anything else until you tell that story once you tell that story you you might think you're done you might think that you've fulfilled your life's purpose whatever eventually a new story will show up and take its place and Miyazaki being an artist and a storyteller I think is experiencing that where every time he he does another movie, he's like, this will be my final one. I'm, you know, I'm getting up there in age. I want to retire. Um, and uh, I think this is it. But then he sits there for a few years and he finishes a story and it goes to theaters. And then something scratches at his brain. Ooh, that's a good idea. Maybe I should make that. And then he's back out of retirement. And that's going to happen multiple times. And maybe this next project that he's working on after The Boy and the Heron will not be his last project as well. But going on to this, um, uh, the legendary animator first claimed that he wanted to step back from feature-length films after the release of Princess Mononoke in 1997, citing his age and the difficulties of heading the production of such a massive project. He announced his retirement again in 2013 after the release of The Wind Rises, though he continued to assist the studio's production for several years before for, uh, formally returning in 2018 to helm The Boy and the Heron. Um, and then they talk about uh, The Boy and the Heron here. Okay. There's a lot here, and I, I, I feel like I kind of gave my thoughts already midway through, but I'll, I'll summarize and see if there's anything else I want to say. Miyazaki's an artist. Artists have to create. It's what we do. He's, he, he can't help it. It's a pathological need of his to continue to create, and the thing will eventually drive him crazy if he doesn't make it. Speaking from experience. And so he can't help not make it. Um, and so I, I forget just how old he is. Hayao Miyazaki. Uh, he is 82. Okay, he's 82. I thought he was 83, but he's 82. He, he will continue until his dying breath. There will be a story on his mind that is eating away at him being like, make me make me, make me, you know, and he's going to be like, no, no, I want to retire, and then uh, he'll make it, because you can't, you can't avoid the call, if you're a true artist, you can't avoid it, you, you can't shut it off, it's just, it's just, it's just there, um, and so it, it, this doesn't surprise me, um, this does make me a little madder about the marketing campaign for the boy there, but, you know, you live and you learn, but that being said, that is everything to do with the boy and the heron this week. Uh, there's probably going to be some more stories as we talk about it next week. Um, but yeah, the trailer came out. Uh, we we talked about the box office for it. Uh, premiered at Toronto International Film Festival. Uh, we talked about some of the reviews. Got 100% on Rotten Tomatoes. And we found out that Miyazaki is not actually going to be retiring, which is insane to me. But anyways, we're going to move on into the next story of this episode, and that is the live action One Piece. So the live action One Piece, probably the biggest story outside of the Boy and the Heron of like the past week. Okay. Um, it is, it's, it, I, I, don't, I don't know how you, how you describe it. it it's just, it's a freaking phenomenon. Okay. It, it's a, it's a phenomenon. Okay. So it premiered last week. And so now everybody was asking what like the rankings were, how how did it come out, how did it perform, and we finally got the answer. So, uh, because it takes a little bit for Netflix to reveal that. Uh, so we have this from Anime News Network. Live action One Piece series debuts at number one on Netflix's global English TV rankings. The series had 18.5 million total views with 141 million hours viewed. Netflix revealed on Tuesday that the Hollywood live-action series of Eiichiro Oda's One Piece manga ranked at number one on Netflix's global English language television rankings in its first week on the service during the period of August 28th to September 23rd. The series had 18.5 million total views with 140.1 uh, million hours uh, viewed and an average runtime of seven, uh, seven and a half hours. And then here's the big piece of art. 
Uh, the show ranked in the top 10 in 96 countries, uh, and it ranked uh, number one in 46 of them. Uh, it ranked number two in the U.S. under Who is Aaron Carter Limited Series. By comparison, Who is Aaron Carter Limited Series ranked number two on the service's global English language television rankings with 90.3 million views, 15.8 million hours watched, and an average runtime of five point or five uh, hours and 43 minutes. Is that what that's supposed to say? Uh, the series debuted exclusively on Netflix on yada, yada, yada. Um, I don't see like a comparison, uh, a, a well comparison to the other number one thing, but it's, it's, it's taken over. It's insane. Uh, now is this as big as some of us would have liked it to be? Maybe, maybe not for me. I think this is great. I'd give it an A. I think it could have gotten an A plus, but I think I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to give it an A. The reason why I'm going to give it an A is because it's, I don't think it reached the potential that it could have. Now, obviously the potentials that it could have reached are not this uh, show's fault. I think that the show is phenomenal, but you have the strike, so people can't really promote it. And on top of that, you have, uh, the history of Hollywood anime adaptations. These things freaking suck. No one cares. And so suddenly it's like, oh great, they're going to ruin one piece now. No one knows it's actually good. And so it comes out and people are like, I'm not going to watch it. I've been like pooped in the mouth multiple times by freaking Hollywood when they make these things, uh, you know, with, you know, uh, Death Note, Dragon Ball, um, for half the audience, Alita, uh, Cowboy Bebop. Um, and so it's like, I'm not going to waste my time watching another thing that's awful with an adaptation. I I'd rather just go like watch the anime or not watch anything at all. And so I, I get it. And so I think if all of those things were there, if there were no strikes going on, if you know, these had been good, uh, or, or if anime adaptations had been good so far, this would have been an A plus, you know, score like this, this would have just dominated everything. But because of all the hurdles that it had to overcome, the fact that it still did this is an A, and it, it's still fantastic. But that is not the biggest story of what we're talking about with One Piece today. The biggest story we're talking about with One Piece is this. Apparently, One Piece Season 2 has already been written. Now, this doesn't surprise us, okay? Now, what do they mean by it's already written? Okay, maybe maybe they did what, you know, the anime does where they basically just take the manga, put it over here. So, like, maybe they just rewrote what the manga script is, okay? And maybe they, that's what they're saying when it's created, when it's already written. Or they have a first draft, in which case they could get everybody in place. They know where their locations are going to be. They know who they're casting. And then maybe they'll rearrange some lines, change some scenes around, yada, yada, yada. But for the most part, the general idea is there and they can begin moving with production. This is what they say from Anime Corner. The One Piece live action producers have said that the scripts for season two are already ready, though the production for the potential season aren't able to begin until the SAG AFR strike has been resolved. They've also said that the next season could be ready to air in a year to 18 months after production would be able to begin. So a lot of people in Hollywood, a lot of the, the scholars on these things are predicting that this strike is going to go into 2024. I am praying that it doesn't. Um, I would really like to, not for the content reason, I mean... I'm not going to lie, that's a part of it because I really like watching art and things that people create, but I really want uh, the people who work hard to make these things, the people who write stuff, the people who act in these things, I really want them to get what they deserve to be paid and what they deserve to need to live because um, these people are not making enough uh, and they're they're just being screwed over and over and over again by these studios. And so I would really like them sooner rather than later to resolve this issue, which it seems like the studios are finally being like, okay, we're losing too much money. We got to get into this. So hopefully, maybe not in 2024, hopefully maybe Christmas miracle, please. Yeah. I don't know. We'll see. But um, going over here, uh, so that means if this does happen in 2024, which would be what most people are predicting, this is going to be a tw early 2025 to a mid 2025 release, which is kind of what this is. Was this was a mid year release? This could be a mid 2025 year release, which would be two years after. Um, the CEO of Tomorrow Studios, which is behind the production of One Piece live action, Marty Andelstein, uh, told Variety that they've uh, got the scripts ready. While Tomorrow Studios president Becky Clements said that season two could launch as early as next year, as soon as a the moment they'd like to be able to get going. Realistically, hopefully a year away if we move very quickly, and that is a possibility. Somewhere between a year and eighteen months, we could be ready for air. Uh, while there is no actual announcement for the sequel, the series did top Netflix's global TV chart um, in its debut week, gathering uh, garnering. 18.5 million total views, 140.1 million hours viewed, and an average runtime of seven hours and 34 minutes in the period of 30 uh, of four days. 
Um, Clements also told Variety, they keep it, as you know, close to the vest until post-launch. But with Netflix's support of the title, we expected it to be number one. And we sensed their research and algorithms probably saw the possibility for that. But in our subsequent calls post-launch, we have been told that we have exceeded expectations, which is also fantastic. Yeah. So like I was saying, I while I say that it was an A debut, I mean in terms of its potential, like if we had a blank slate, in terms of its absolute potential, I think it's an A because um, it still did amazing. But in terms of everything that it had to get through, it's an A+, plus, um, which I think is still, uh, an A is still great. An A is still passing, guys. Everybody calm down. Um, and so, yeah, we have season two ready. It's or not ready, but it's written. Um, there might still some be some kinks that they need to work out in it, which we talked about, but they would still be able to start, uh, you know, production um, and everything like that. And because uh, they already know where they're going, you know, like the anime is over a thousand episodes. The manga is even further than the anime. I think they're fine. They know where they're going. So that's the One Piece news for this week. Now, we have some smaller things. A small little thing that I want to let everybody know about is that Berserk is actually coming back. It starts its new arc. Uh, oh, there we go. Uh, Berserk manga starts new arc, gets new chapter on September 22nd. Um, and then they talk about uh, how it's coming back here. Uh, we don't have enough time to go into this topic in detail. We do have some other stuff that we need to talk about. But I just wanted to let you guys know that Berserk is coming back. And uh, you guys can look more into detail on that if you're a Berserk fan like me. So getting into the um, final big story of the day before we get into, you know, the Goofy Woofy anime community moment and the uh, audience rankings and reading your comments, we have this. So we've talked about this with Uncle Roger. Uh, last week we've talked about this before, but fair use does not exist in Japan like it does in America. And even or at least because I'm in America when I'm making this, that's what I can reference. Um, I don't know fair use laws in every single country, but in America, we have supposedly fair use, um, even though we still get copyright things all the time because we're like, how could you use our stuff? It's like, oh, it's fair use. Oh, blah, blah, blah. It's crazy. So we have this. Japanese YouTuber sentenced to two years in prison for sharing gameplay and anime videos. Uh, the Sendai District Court has sentenced the 53-year-old Japanese YouTuber Shinobu Yoshida to two years in prison with a five-year suspended sentence and a one million yen fine for sharing Steins Gate gameplay videos and a Spy X Family anime video. This is the first time that someone has been convicted of violating the copyright laws by sharing gameplay videos. The judge was Koichi Nakamura, and the suspended sentence means that he won't have to serve it if he doesn't commit a crime in the next five years. Prosecution originally asked for the two-year sentence and yen fine. Uh, the defendant was charged with infringing copyright by distributing three videos on YouTube from September 19th to May 2022 without permission, including a spoiler gameplay video, which included the ending to the Steins Gate, My Darling Embrace game, as well as an edited video of the anime Spy Family. The prosecution argued that it was a malicious act that trampled on the effort of content creation by discouraging the, porch, uh, the purchase of the original products, while the defendant said at trial that he wanted someone to see what that uh, to see what he created as part of his hobby. Steins Gate, My Darling's Embrace, uh, is a visual novel video game developed by 5BP, uh, originally released for the Xbox uh, 360 in 2011. It has since received several ports, most recently being Spy... I don't really care about this. Okay. So, people in the otaku anime manga fold have been talking about this so not really a surprise because sadly we know about these goofy fair use laws in japan um the thing that is it is that uh it, i mean it sucks and I, I i really disagree with what this person is saying uh with their argument the prosecution argued that it was a malicious act that trampled on the effort of con content creation so he was like he's trying to destroy the work of the people who made this and he's blah, 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 blah. and it's also gonna cause people not to buy the original product and they'll just watch his video where he's saying bro i just like edited the stuff like to make you know a different experience because you know but you know whatever it is what it is but okay here's here's the big thing here's what i actually want to talk about Right here, it says the judge was uh, Koichi Nakamura and the sentence or the suspended sentence. So we have a suspended sentence, which means that he doesn't have to serve it if he doesn't commit a crime in the next five years. So he won't be able to make content probably ever again. Um, and then uh, he doesn't have to serve his sentence. So I believe uh, he's now paying the one million yen fine. Uh, the, it says the prosecution originally asked for the two year sentence and 
the yen fine. So they wanted both. The judge said, okay, we can pay the fine, but if you pay the fine, we'll let you go free if you don't pay, if you, or if you don't have, if you, if you don't commit a crime in the next five years and you don't have to serve your sentence. So Israel, how much money is that? Okay. So let's go to the yen to USD converter, everybody. Let's do this. Okay. Boom. Here we go. Let me zoom in a bit. Okay. That's a little, maybe a little, uh, okay. Now you can see it. Okay. So let's do a million, 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000, 100,000, million. That's not right. Is it? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So that, he's paying basically like $7,000. In fines, which I'm not saying that's a little like, oh, bro, it's just a little bit of money, but um, yeah, uh, that uh, look, it's I, I think people read the headline and were like, yeah, he's going, he's being arrested, he's behind bars. While, yes, that was the original sentence, he's not actually being that's not actually what's happening. Um, and I think it is, it is weird, um for us to live in a fair use, at least where the discourse is coming from, it's in countries with fair use, where we can make content like this. And then it's like unfathomable to us to think that someone could go to jail for two years for showing videos of a video game and of um, an anime. Because we do that all the time over here. You know, like go watch one of my seasonal reviews. It's an hour of anime footage. And I'm like, I'm fine. Like I don't get struck. I don't get copyright claims. It's ridiculous. And so then you have these happening in other countries where this is happening. Look, I'm no uh, law expert. Uh, I, I don't really know anything about the justice system. Um, and I'd be a buffoon to say that I had anything super enlightening to say. But it's, and I, I, this might be pessimistic, but I, I'm trying to view it objectively and realistically. It, this doesn't surprise me because of the fair use claims uh, or, or the fair use laws that they have in Japan where they can cro copyright strike or claim someone just by even like mentioning a title or something. And I'm happy that he's he's not having to serve the sentence and that it got suspended. He still has to pay a lot of money. Um, but at least he's not going to prison. And I know it's like, Israel, what kind of take is that? Like, you should be like, oh, boo, this law system is garbage. Maybe if I was more educated on these things, I could, but I'm going to try to be humble and admit that I, I'm not like a pro on this. And this would be probably someone that you should, or this, I, I'm going to defer this to someone who's more enlightened on these issues. I'm sure there's more people on like Twitter or something who actually have law degrees who study these things and can like give a more nuanced take than just me being like, uh, yeah, it, it sucks. I have no power to control the legislation in Japan. What am I going to say? Change the law. They're not going to listen to me. I mean, I could say that Japan change the law. It's goofy. Come on. 21st century. And, uh, yeah, that's really all I had to say. I don't know. I feel, I guess, what am I supposed to do? Hey, hey, what am I? Gosh, ridiculous. But that being said, guys, we're going to move on in everybody's favorite part of the show here. The Goofy Woofy Anime Community. All right, so we have this. So girlfriend, girlfriend, Kanojo Mokanojo ended last year, very er, earlier this year. Very, very sad. One of my favorite mangas ever. It's hilarious. I love it. It's great. Season two of the anime is coming out later this year, and I cannot wait to watch it. Anyways, the mangaka, the author, um, Hiroyuki, has uh, made a new, uh, or he's going to be publishing a new story. And he's basically self-reporting of like something he did that was kind of goofy. Okay, so here we go. Girlfriend, girlfriend, mangaka, Hiroyuki, to publish a story about a broke mangaka with a, an expensive wristwatch addiction. Hiroyuki, girlfriend, girlfriend, and Aho Girl author launched a new work titled Anime Ka for Sakuhin no Magaka ga ede doke ni hamata keka 5,000 yen. No, so, oh my gosh, how long is this title? The plot of the new book tells the story of Hiroyuki who accidentally got drawn into the world of luxury items and somehow ended up broke. It will be out on October 11th and published under Wani Books. Although it is not a manga, it will feature some art drawn by the author. That's crazy, bro. 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 <laughs> So he's going to, he's, he's going to like try to get out of being broke by writing and selling the story of how he became broke. Honestly, you got to appreciate the hustle, but that's hilarious. Like, you know, 
I'm not going to say he's like rich or loaded with money, but he's successful. Um, very, very successful. Um, I, I, I mean, I, I forget if Hiroyuki is a, is a he or not. Uh, yeah, okay, it is. Because uh, they didn't say the first name. They just say Hiroyuki. Um, so Hiroyuki, like, like bro, 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 my guy. <laughs> bro spends... All the, because girlfriend girlfriend is not like a massive empire like Attack on Titan or Demon Slayer or whatever, but it's a very successful manga. It's a very successful anime. It's like, bro, you're gonna get all the money from that and be like, I'm gonna spend it, spend it all on this Riz Ross watch collection. Oh no, the manga's over. I'm broke. Uh, uh, let me monetize my story of how I became broke <laughs> to not be broke anymore. Honestly. I like it. I think that's hilarious. That's probably the certified goofy moment because that's a true goofy moment. The next one is kind of cute, but I didn't know where else to put it and I still wanted to talk about it. So let's get into that, which is this. So obviously Pokemon um, has had some changes. Uh, Ash is being retired as a character because Ash finally became the Pokemon master and they're moving on to a different character. Um, but we have this. So the original Ash Ketchum voice actor is launching a Pokemon rewatch podcast which is really really cool so uh ash ketchum's original voice actor uh veronica taylor is launching a pokemon podcast about the anime series veronica taylor the original english voice actor for ash ketchum in the 1997 pokemon anime is launching a podcast dedicated to the original tv series on x taylor dropped the first teaser trailer for her pokemon season one rewatch podcast called the trainer's guide as mentioned in the trailer uh taylor will be rewatching the first season of the anime with her daughter rena taylor during the show's production veronica was pregnant with rena as she began voice act uh voicing ash and gave birth to her at the end of the season Rena even joked i was in the womb uh before i was in the room this is really really cute to me this is really really fun uh if you're a big pokemon fan um I, I didn't grow up watching Pokemon. I, I had a bad childhood, but you know, no, uh, I just didn't watch Pokemon. Um, so this this might not. I mean, I can I can acknowledge intellectually that like, oh, this is really cool, but I I can't. I probably won't have that connection. So if you're really nostalgic about this, I would recommend giving this uh, podcast a watch. I don't see where they can. Uh, where you can listen to the podcast just yet. Um, so maybe we'll get more news about that. But so far, they've just announced that the fact that she's doing it with her daughter, who she was pregnant with while she was voicing Ash, is really cool too. It's like bring full circle, connecting it, taking like the, some of the two biggest parts of her life and putting them together. I think that's really, really cool. I think that's really, really sweet. So the goofy moment, the certified goofy moment this week is going to the girlfriend, girlfriend mangaka. And then the certified cute moment this week is going to the Pokemon podcast story but that being said guys we're gonna move on into the anime corner audience ranking here so i should have had this prep to go but i didn't i totally forgot i got so lost in the sauce of the story but uh, okay here we go so here's the anime corner audience rankings so at number one we have jujutsu kaisen season two which is back for its uh second uh, for, for the second arc of this season. So I believe this was, was the second episode of this arc. Um, and it uh, went up three spots from rank four to rank one and got 8.42% 8, 8 of the vote. Mushoku Tensei season two went up one spot from rank three to rank two and got 7.37% of the vote. Zalm 100 Bucket List of the Dead went down one spot from rank two to rank three and that got 6.48% of the vote. My Happy Marriage went up three spots from rank seven to rank four and that got 5.64 or 62% of the vote. Dark Gathering uh, stayed at the same rank that it was at last week, which was at number five and that got 4.87% of the vote. Bungo Stray Dogs 5 uh, stayed at the same rank as it was last week, which was number 6, and that got 4.42% of the vote. The Girl I Like Forgot, her glasses um, went up 8 spots from rank 18 or rank 15 to rank 7, and that got 3.21% of the vote. Rurouni Kenshin 2023 went up 2 spots from rank 10 to rank 8, and that got 2.95% of the vote. Undead Girl Murder Farce went down 1 spot to rank 8. Uh, went, went down one spot from rank eight to rank nine, and that got 2.9% of the vote. And Masamune Kun's Revenge R went uh, from rank 14 up four spots to rank 10 and got 2.85% of the vote. And that's going to do it for the audience rankings there. And we're going to move on to the final part of the show where I take or, or where I respond to at least your comments from the previous episode of the Otaku Experience. This was this last episode was the episode where we talk about Uncle Roger and Toei Animation. Uh, this was about a week ago, I think, now, at this point. And so we have Adios, Adios. Um, I'm trying to find a way to, there we go. Okay, this works. Okay, so up first we have 
You can't see his profile, but there's the profile picture. There, there. It's underneath. There. Okay. So the gist with Jared. Uh, free use can certainly be tricky to navigate for content creators. Glad the copyright strike was taken back. Have you seen my adventures with Superman? Yes, I have. I've, I'm not fully caught up on it, but I've seen a couple episodes. I really enjoyed it. It's really cute. I like the anime aspects. Superman is my favorite superhero. I love the transformation anime-esque style thing. That's really, really fun. I heard it's over, so I might go and binge it uh, because they're, they're shorter episodes. They're really fun to watch. Um, if you haven't seen Superman and Lois, uh, or not Superman and Lois, My Adventures with Superman, I recommend everybody goes to check that out because it's a really fun show. It's really um, anime-like. Um, and I think it's really fun. You can find it on Max. And I, uh, if it, if the rest is like season one, I'm going to, uh, or if the rest of season one is like the episodes I've seen, I'm going to love it. And I cannot wait for season two. Getting over to the second and last one of the day, we have Eli Craig. There's a profile picture. Why do you think franchises, Star Wars, Lord of the Rings, Rick and Morty, DC, etc., are using anime as a storytelling medium? Does it offer for the creators or what does it offer for the creators and for the audience? That's a really interesting question. So obviously we've talked about this before. This was how I convinced Rob to let me do the otaku experience. Anime is becoming a huge game changer in the pop culture space. It's becoming a huge medium in the pop culture space. You know, you have movies, you have video games, and now you have anime. And they're like the three big things. And so uh, there was a, a study that came out earlier this year. And that found that 50% of Gen Z, which would be my generation, watches Gen Z. And so you have these studios starting to realize that there's a big market here. You know, when Demon Slayer makes half a billion dollars at the worldwide box office, when you have Jujutsu Kaisen coming in and making a lot of money at the worldwide box office, the studios aren't going to ignore that. They're, the studios are seeing money, whereas the creators are seeing a new way to tell stories. Because the way anime is, because it's from a totally different culture, there's so many different things that you can do that work in anime that don't work in our culture. Just like there's so many things that you can do in our culture and our animation stuff that wouldn't necessarily work in anime because there's different, they're, they're just different types of styles because there's different type of cultures and it's awesome. And so what they're finding with anime is that anime is so over the top and so extreme and crazy that you can do stuff like that. So with Star Wars, for example, Star Wars Visions was amazing. You know, George Lucas based Star Wars off of Seven Samurai and Kurosawa films, which, you know, is inherently Japanese. Anime itself is inherently Japanese. And so those things kind of just are perfect for each other with Lord of the Rings. You know, have you seen Attack on Titan? Have you seen these big... Um, crazy epic shows that are like big these big sprawling epics where they're traveling places and they're having these big fights with these non-human uh monsters like isekai and things like that that's what lord of the rings is and so it's like hey we can put this in this really interesting visual medium where we can have a different art style that we maybe couldn't achieve in live action or in the styles that we do here in um, america um or, or or in uh you know western media or whatever and you know we can we can you know do something more creative that way. Uh, Rick and Morty, another thing where anime. Have you seen comedic anime? There, so the studios are seeing the capital uh, that can come off of it. They're seeing the income that they can make from it and the reach that it has. The creatives are seeing the more creative aspect to it and what they can do and a different approach that they can apply to these franchises that we know so well from a different way and a different look at them that we've never seen them before because you're having different people make them. That would be my guess. And so it kind of works for both parties. Um, and anime is very inexpensive to make. Um, and so, uh, I mean, they can, they can, they should definitely spend a bit more because they need more time to make these shows. Um, they need to pay their workers more. We, we can talk about that in and out. But just in terms of looking at what it is right now, on paper, making anime is incredibly cheap compared to the stuff we make over here in the States. And so it's like, oh, you want me to make that and get like all of this like you know, people talking about it, uh, all of this news, everybody watching it, like, oh, easy, duh. And then the creatives get to be like, okay, well, now we get to tell a story that's really interesting. And, you know, when they do these anime stuff, they they let these other creators tell, like Star Wars Visions, they gave it to other countries. They were like, here, you tell what your version of, uh, of this is. Um, and they just let them have creative reign. Now, the way that Star Wars could do it is they were like, hey, this isn't canon. And so you get to do whatever the heck you want with Lord of the Rings. Uh, they're basing it off of, I believe, a uh, one of the Lord of the Rings books, or at least a story that's referenced in the books. Um, with Rick and Morty, that in and of itself is very 
hilarious goofy stuff so i think that works very well for like comedic anime stuff in dc you know like with my adventures with superman i never knew i needed like superman putting on his costume in an anime style way but now i have it and i love it um and so i i i would say that that's why before i start you know just circling my thoughts and repeating myself but anyways guys that's gonna do it for today's sunday episode of the otaku experience I want to thank you guys so much for watching this episode. Uh, if you'd like to keep up with me outside of the show, you can subscribe to me on YouTube at King Tannic. You can uh, follow me on Instagram at King Tannic, or you can follow me on X, formerly known as Twitter, at King Tannic Israel. If you're new to the Burnett Network, consider sticking around. We have some great shows for you to watch every single day, including but not limited to Rob Observations, Ladies of the PGS, Midnight Musings, k PGS, Architects of Imagination, Let's Get Physical Media, and of course, the Otaku Experience. And with all that being said, guys, that'll do it for me. I will see you all on Thursday.